from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous vile and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on Jerry Brudos. Jerry Brudos was born on January 31st, 1939, making him an Aquarius in Webster, South Dakota. And as we always do, let's get into some of the history at that time. In 1939, World War II began when the Nazis from Germany attacked Poland. The results of this was France, Australia, and the UK declaring war against Germany. The world was still trying to finish recovering from the First World War, the Great Depression, and so on. Hitler had served in World War I and had suffered the effects of mustard gas, and ultimately he felt humiliated by his own country, so he rose through the ranks and became the dictator of Germany, hell-bent on restoring Germany to glory. In 1938, he was beginning to expand the country into Austria and then bits of Czechoslovakia with no opposition from the UK or France. Then, in 1939, he began building up his navy and also took over what was left of Czechoslovakia. Hitler joined forces with Italy's leader Mussolini, saying that they would be allies in, quote, all manners of war. Italy had just successfully taken over Albania. Two days after the Nazis invaded Poland, war was declared against them by many major powers in the world, except the United States. The U.S. would stay, quote, neutral until Japan attacked Pearl Harbor as well as German ships attacking U.S. ships. Physicists, including Einstein, stated that Germany was capable of making and detonating nuclear bombs. They sent a letter to President Roosevelt basically stating that it would behoove the U.S. to research this as well. Also in 1939, Russian troops invaded Finland after trying to negotiate a land deal with them. This skirmish was all due to Russia wanting to have more land around the Russian city Leningrad so that they could better protect it from the threat of the Nazi invasion. Though the Russians did technically win this battle, they lost several tens of thousands more soldiers than Finland did. This outcome made Russia's military look somewhat weak, giving Germany the added confidence to continue on with the war. On a lighter note, William Hewlett and David Packard created what we know today as Hewlett Packard or HP. They created it with only $540 between them part time in a rented garage in California. Their first product was a machine that could test sound equipment. Their first client, the Walt Disney Company. They bought eight of them and used them while creating the film Fantasia. Now, as far as the cost of living in the United States in 1939, a new house was roughly $3,800. A yearly wage was averaged at $1,800. A gallon of gas was only 10 cents to put in your new car that would have cost something around $700. Grocery shopping? A loaf of bread would have set you back 
8 cents along with 14 cents for a pound of hamburger meat and a can of Campbell's tomato soup was four cans for 25 cents. South Dakota itself, even though it is situated in the very northern central part of the United States, it is still considered part of the Midwest. It has excellent soil and a lot of important crops are grown there. The area Jerry was born in is near the northeast top corner of the state. Interestingly, Tom Brokaw, the anchorman for NBC, was also born there. The population around the time Jerry was born was about 1,800 people, so it was a pretty small town. His parents were Henry and Eileen Brudos. Now, Henry Brudos was born in 1896 in South Dakota, and Eileen was born in 1904, making Henry eight years her senior. They lived on a farm and they had their first child, Larry, soon after. Larry was intelligent and very well behaved. Both Henry and Eileen had intended for Larry to be their only child, but when she became pregnant again, they had their hopes up for a baby girl. When Jerry was born, his mother Eileen made no secret of the fact that she wanted a daughter, not another son. She was a rigid and unemotional woman who was very much conservative in the way she thought and dressed. His father Henry was a very angry and violent man who was quite easily offended. Between his father's anger and verbal abuse toward Jerry, as well as his mother near complete rejection of him, the beginning of his life was hard. Now before red-haired, blue-eyed Jerry was old enough to start kindergarten, the family packed up and moved to Portland, Oregon. At five years old, an occurrence would happen in Jerry's life that would forever change him. He was playing around in a junkyard, though why a five-year-old child was left unsupervised to play in a junkyard is beyond me, but nonetheless, he found a discarded pair of high-heeled, open-toed shoes amongst the trash and was instantly drawn to them. He picked them up, he brought them home, and he tried them on. When his mother found her son wearing scandalous high heels, she became enraged. She took the shoes outside and burned them, an act forever seared into his mind. The family moved again not long after and Jerry started first grade in Riverton, California. His teacher wore high-heeled shoes but would sometimes take them off and leave them under her desk. Jerry took them and put them in his book bag. It was, of course, discovered that he had her shoes and the teacher took them back, leaving Jerry really embarrassed. When Jerry was in the second grade, he became very sick. The doctor diagnosed him with measles, a sore throat, swollen glands, and laryngitis. It has also been stated that he had to endure several surgeries on his legs and arms due to a fungal infection of some kind. He complained constantly that he was having headaches so intense that he could barely see. He was tested, but he did not need glasses. Needless to say, he failed the second grade. In Jerry's preteen years, his family moved a couple more times around Oregon. He continued his shoe fetish and often stole women's shoes. As he made friends at school, he would be invited over to their houses to hang out. You know, that's very normal. But once no one was paying attention, Jerry would go into the bedrooms of the boys' sisters or mothers and play with their clothes or steal a pair of their underwear. When Jerry was 13 years old, his brother Larry was 16, 
And as most normal teenage boys are, Larry was curious about the nude female body, and Larry was also a bit of an artist. So he began drawing pictures of women in the nude, but he kept them carefully stowed away in a box so that their mother would not find them. Jerry, of course, found the box and was curious about what was inside of it, and when he found the drawings, his mother just happened to walk into the room. Now, rather than letting Larry get in trouble, Jerry took the fall, and Eileen was furious. As Jerry began to go through puberty, he had his, quote, night emissions, which is perfectly normal and healthy, but his mother was disgusted by anything sexual in nature. When she realized there were stains on his sheets, she forced him to wash them by hand. At this point, Jerry later stated he began to fantasize about capturing a girl and forcing her to obey his every command as well as beg for mercy. The shoes and underwear he stole became the material he gravitated toward when he pleasured himself. And at 16 years old, Jerry felt like he needed to act on his fantasies. So he broke into a neighbor's house. He went to the girl's dresser and he stole her underwear. For whatever reason, he told the girl he would help her find her underwear and to come over to his house. I really don't know how that worked, but when the girl showed up, she found a man with a mask on, holding a knife pointed at her and demanded she come inside. So of course she did. He then made her take off her clothes. Jerry got out his Polaroid camera and took pictures of her naked. He then left the house. And as she was leaving, she ran into Jerry and he said he had seen the masked man who had locked him in the barn. The girl told the police, but there's no information as to what was done about it or if they knew that it had been Jerry. Regardless, Jerry tried to date other girls, but he was awkward around them, not to mention he was overweight and had pretty bad acne, so the girls, for the most part, didn't want to date him. So, in 1956, when Jerry was 17, he lured a 17-year-old girl into his car. He then drove to an abandoned farmhouse where he proceeded to beat her severely and ordered her to take her clothes off. Luckily, a couple who happened to be driving by saw what was happening and notified the police. Now, Jerry stated that he had stopped to help this girl from an attacker, but the police took him in. Once there, he confessed to what he had done to her. The police went to Jerry's house and into his room, where they found women's underwear, women's shoes, photo equipment, and his Polaroids. He was then arrested for assault and battery and committed to the Oregon State Hospital, but he was allowed to leave during the day to attend school. While at the state hospital, he was diagnosed with, quote, adjustment reaction of adolescence with sexual deviation and fetishism, as well as borderline schizophrenic, which was actually a fairly common diagnosis given during those days. Jerry stayed in the hospital for nearly nine months, and when the doctors decided that he was no longer a threat to society, they let him go. He then went on to graduate from high school, but he graduated in the lower 30% of his class. So that was Jerry's childhood, and there's a lot to cover, so let's dig in. Now, all parents, when they are expecting a baby, will ponder if the baby is a boy or a girl. That question is as old as time. Some parents hope for one or the other, and that is also very common. But if the baby is born the gender the parents weren't hoping for, they still love the baby unconditionally and are happy to have a happy and healthy child regardless. Except 
for Jerry Brudos's parents. Now, of course, back then they didn't have the technology that we do today to have the ultrasound to see which gender the baby was while she was still pregnant. So every birth back then was a surprise. But Jerry's parents' reaction set him up for negative feelings. He would have felt frustrated, unwanted, flawed due to his gender, depressed. I mean, the list goes on and on. He would have, at such a young age, have a huge reaction when his mother took the shoes, the scandalous shoes that he had found and burned them right in front of him. It would have impressed upon him that the shoes were sort of like a forbidden fruit and his mother being such a negative influence in his young life, it would have made the shoes even more significant. Most children want what they can't have. It was also mentioned that his mother never bonded with him as an infant and if that statement is true then that would be very harmful to Jerry's mental maturing. The effects of not bonding with your baby can and often result in the child having behavioral issues and trouble dealing with their emotions or new situations and this will carry on well into their adult life. This lack of bond and attention to the child can make the child develop attachment disorders which look like You know, the child will have difficult, aggressive behaviors toward other children or adults. Um, The child will be withdrawn and isn't interested in interacting with other children and adults. They'll be very socially awkward. Um, They're often anxious or depressed. And the child will often be unable to control their temper or emotional outbursts. The child will not be successful at school generally. Once a teen, they will be much more likely to get into trouble with the police. They will display very inappropriate behavior toward peers. I mean, you see where this is all headed. And while a childhood illness is noted, he was taken care of during that time, and he liked the attention that he received from it. As he was going through puberty, his mother made him feel ashamed of the natural happenings of his body. And this is emotionally abusive, making him feel like something his body did involuntarily was shameful or disgusting and would create a negative emotion toward naturally occurring sexual function. Once he began to be old enough to have some level of personal independence and wanted to start dating, he was again rejected by girls due to his social awkwardness and physical appearance. So the dark fantasies began to take shape and he acted on them. Once he was caught, arrested, and sent to the state hospital, he was officially diagnosed with adjustment reaction of adolescence with sexual deviation and fetishism and borderline schizophrenia. So let's look at that. According to John Hopkins, adjustment disorders are an emotional or behavioral reaction to stressful events in a person's life. There's not a single direct cause between the stressor and the reaction. Children and adolescents are all unique individuals. They vary in experience, coping skills, vulnerability, and temperament. The stress also varies as far as how long it lasts or how strong it was and the effect it had on the young person. It becomes disordered when the reaction to the stressor far exceeds what is considered normal. Symptoms of adjustment disorders are depression, feeling hopeless, um, nervousness, violation of the rights of others, violation of societal rules, and so on. And then As far as the borderline schizophrenia, which is sort of the unofficial merging of borderline personality disorder and symptoms of schizophrenia, according to Oxford, is a chronic illness that is often associated with many symptoms, 
but is generally thought to be a perceptual cognitive abnormality. Believe it or not, there is some evidence that suggests that it is genetic and has a familial distribution with schizophrenia. Another label is schizotypal personality. People with this disorder might have social anxiety, hypersensitivity to real or imagined criticism. They socially isolate. They have very few or no close friends. These people will be putting forth a lot of effort to avoid real or imagined abandonment and display a pattern of unstable and intense relationships of either idealization or devaluation. And finally, let's address sexual deviation and fetishism. Now the term quote sexual deviation is now referred to as paraphilia, which is an intense sexual attraction that is abnormal. So in other words, being aroused by inanimate objects, situations, fantasies, behaviors, or individuals. This is also called sexual fetishism. So I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So if you have a very small boy who basically knew from the beginning of his memory that his mother wished that he had been a girl, the harmless act of being curious about shoes that he had never seen his mother wear got somehow twisted into something forbidden and naughty. I think most kids, male or female, try on their mother or father's shoes and it is just a simple, innocent act. Her over-the-top reaction created something in his mind that blossomed into a disturbance. So let's continue with his life. Some sources say Jerry joined the military but was quickly discharged due to his odd obsessions. He was forced to move back home with his parents, but they made him live in their shed. When he was 21 years old, he went out to run an errand one evening and he saw a girl walking. It piqued his interest, so he followed her home. He then grabbed her and strangled her until she became unconscious, stealing her shoes and running back home. He then slept with those shoes in bed with him. But as far as meeting women, he was still having a hard time. Jerry later stated this was due to him not trusting women. He did manage to get his FCC license and went to work as an electronics technician at a radio station. And there, the now 22-year-old Jerry met 17-year-old Darcy Metzler. She agreed to go out with him and they began dating. Now, Darcy's parents were wholeheartedly against their relationship. Some say that her parents' disapproval made her want to rebel and she gave Jerry a lot more attention than he had ever been used to. He asked her to marry him within months of them beginning to date and they were married not long after. And then came along their daughter, Megan. Now the couple moved around quite a bit, up and down the West Coast, because Jerry had a hard time keeping stable employment. He was also constantly begging his wife to let him take nude photos of her, as well as giving in to his strange sexual demands. But she grew tired of it and told him she would not be doing any of those things anymore. Jerry said later that it made him feel like she didn't love him anymore, that he felt ashamed of what he was asking her to do in the first place. But finally, the young family settled down in Portland, Oregon, and Jerry got a job as an electrician, and life became fairly comfortable, you know, predictable. Darcy became pregnant again, and Jerry was excited to have another child. However, Darcy refused to allow Jerry to be in the birthing room while his son was being born, even though she did allow him to be in there when their daughter was born. This upset him even further, and he began to go out and steal women's shoes and underwear again. So at 28 years old, Jerry was feeling rejected. 
He followed a woman home one night and watched her through her window waiting for her to go to bed. Once he was sure she was asleep, he broke into her house with the intent of stealing her shoes, but she woke up unexpectedly. So Jerry jumped on her and began to strangle her. She fought hard, but he overpowered her and she became unconscious. He then raped her, took her shoes, and fled. This act awakened the fantasies he had been having since he was young, and it was the turning point for him. On January 26, 1968, 19-year-old Linda Slauson knocked on the Brudos' door. When Jerry answered, she explained that she was an encyclopedia saleswoman. Jerry said he was interested, and could she come in and follow him to his garage? Now this garage was something else. He deemed it his safe space where he stored his stolen items, his photographs, where he could indulge himself in his fantasies and fetishes. He kept the door to the garage locked at all times and not even his wife was allowed entry. He and Linda walked past his wife and children to that garage. Once in, he hit her in the head with a two by four piece of wood, effectively knocking her unconscious. He then strangled her to death. After, he removed all of her clothing and put other underwear and garments on her body, posing her in very suggestive ways and taking photos. He then used a hacksaw and cut off her foot, placing it in the freezer to use as a foot model for other women's shoes he had stolen. Once he was done with her, he wrapped her body up, he put it in his car, he drove to the Willamette River where he pretended to have a flat tire. He then dumped her body into the river. Then on November 26th, 1968, 23-year-old college student Jan Susan Whitney was driving home for the holiday break from school when her car broke down. Jerry saw her on the side of the road. He pulled over and he offered to give her a lift and she agreed. Once she was inside his car, he strangled her to death. He then raped her corpse. And once he was done, he took the body into his garage and dressed and posed her as he liked photographing the entire process but with this body he chose to keep one of her breasts before disposing of it five months later 19 year old college student karen sprinkler was leaving a department store and heading to her car in a parking garage jerry brudos dressed in women's clothing pointed a gun at her and demanded she come with him he forced her into his car, he drove her to his house, and he made her go into his garage where he forced her to try on all manner of women's underwear. He had her pose for photographs. Then he raped her and strangled her by hanging her from a pulley. Once she was dead, he decided to keep her for a bit, having sex with her corpse on several occasions. He then cut off her breasts and made molds of them. He then tied her body to a small car engine and threw her into the same river. Interestingly, two girls told the police that they actually saw a man in women's clothing near Karen's car in the parking garage where the abandoned car still sat. On April 21st, Jerry went into another parking garage where he saw a young woman named Sharon Wood walking. He attacked her and she fought back, biting him on the thumb so hard that he bled. He then severely beat her until she was unconscious, but before he could strangle her, another car started coming near them and he fled. Frustrated, the very next day, Jerry dressed up as a policeman and encountered 22-year-old Linda Saley outside of a shopping center. He kidnapped her. He brought her back to his house 
and did the same to her as he had his previous victims, only he later stated her breasts were, quote, too pink. So he attempted to send an electrical current through her body to see if it would jolt or move, but it didn't. He then tied her body to a small car transmission and threw her into the river. A month later, Linda's body was found by an area fisherman. Two days after that, Karen's body was found only 50 feet away from Linda's. Police now suspected they had a serial killer on their hands. Jerry began making random phone calls into female dorms at Oregon State University and somehow he was able to actually talk some girls into blind dates with him over the phone. The police were also talking to the girls at the college since some of the victims had been students. Some of the girls commented that a man had been calling them in the dorms and asking for dates. One girl in particular agreed to work with the police and when Jerry called her, she agreed to go out with him. Once Jerry arrived on campus, the police stopped him and questioned him. They were, at least in the moment, satisfied with his responses enough to let him go. They then questioned one of Jerry's survivors, showing her a picture and she positively identified him. They got a search warrant and went to his house. As they searched his garage, they found various items that belonged to the victims as well as like the nylon rope used to tie one of the girls up to the car parts before he tossed them into the river. They arrested him and they took him to the station. Jerry begged his wife to burn articles of women's clothing that he had stashed, but she flat out refused to do so. Finally, after hours of interrogation, he confessed to the murders. He went to trial where he was found guilty and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. At first, his wife Darcy was also charged with aiding and abetting, but she was found not guilty. I mean, she really was not guilty. She quickly divorced him. She moved far away and had a court ordered agreement that her children would never have to visit or write Jerry in prison. Now, while he was in jail, he amassed quite an impressively large collection of women's shoe catalogs in his cell. He would write to these magazines and ask them to send him these catalogs and they did. So after 37 years in prison, Jerry died of liver cancer in 2006. So guys, was Jerry born to kill? Was he conditioned to kill? In my opinion, I believe the pathology was already there, born into him to some degree, but the lack of attention and frequent humiliation from his mother over curiosities that are quite common and normal molded him into the criminal he later became. His mother proudly showed her disgust for all things sexual. There was no dialogue between mother and son. He certainly was made to feel that any sexual urges that he had were deviant and just plain wrong. It isn't much of a stretch to see why women's shoes became a fetish for him, but the fetish alone didn't make him violent. I believe it was his fear, distrust, and hate of women along with the humiliation from being interested in anything sexual from his childhood from his mother is what drove him to be violent. But what do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing or YouTube under the same name as this podcast. You can visit my website at serialkilling.squarespace.com and also consider sponsoring the podcast. It takes many, many hours and a lot of work to gather this info, but I do love it. And thank you so much for listening. 
I appreciate every one of you as I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. Have a great day. Music by Kevin MacLeod on Incompetech.com.